Hey gang, welcome back to the channel. Thought I'd do something a little different this time as opposed to just a straight gameplay of a scenario. I'm referring to uh, the Battle of Hugo Mon, a scenario which I currently have set up, we'll be getting into. But I thought I'd do a complete dive into the that particular battle. It took place in Waterloo and go into some of the details of as to what happened. Uh, dispel some myths and confirm some facts regarding Ugomont and I'll be doing so via the Waterloo Companion this is the complete guide to history's most famous land battle so says it on the cover by Mark Adkin and, and I would argue uh, if you could only own one book on the Battle of Waterloo and there's certainly no shortage of, of uh, available material <clears throat> this would be the one Maybe a little bit pricey, but definitely worth it. Exhaustive, definitely comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> it has my vote of approval. <clears throat> if there's a hum or buzz in the background, I apologize, but it is extreme. We're dealing with extreme heat here in the south, and uh, I cannot do this without the uh, window air conditioner on. So here we go. This is taken from section 9, page... 329 called the highlights and it starts with all right so it starts with something called the outline of events uh, let's see the buildings garden orchard and wood of Ugamal were defended by British guards Nassauers and a few Hanoverians from the first cannon shot at about 11:30 a.m. until the Imperial Guard recoiled almost nine hours later Throughout that time, Ryle's Corps mounted a series of attacks in a vain effort to capture the strong point. The first two assaults were the most determined and came closest to success. By shortly after midday, the wood to the south of the buildings was taken and not fully recovered until the closing stages of the battle. At around 1 p.m., the French made their only penetration of the defenses at the north gate. One officer, and I will go ahead and state now that I will butcher pronunciations, names, and the like such. So please forgive me. One officer, Sous Lieutenant Legros, with about 30 men, smashed their way in, only to be shot down after the gates were closed behind them. For the remainder of the day, the substantially reinforced French launched a succession of attacks with perceptibly diminishing enthusiasm. They took and then lost the Great Orchard, by mid-afternoon, they had set fire to the chateau, farmer's house, and most sheds and barns, but still the only Frenchmen inside the garden or the buildings were corpses, except for a drummer boy who was spared after getting inside the northern farmyard with a gross party. Evening saw Wellington's general advance sweep back into the wood. Ugomont's defenders were, by then, hugely outnumbered by the dead, dying, and wounded from both sides. This epic struggle has been aptly described as a battle within a battle. Then we get to our first somewhat, uh, I don't know if you'd call it an excursus or what, but it goes thusly. Closing the north gate. This gate had been deliberately left open to allow free and speedy access for friendly troops. By 12.30 p.m., McDonald had been pushed back along the west side of the buildings, so his companies were used the north gate through which to withdraw under pressure into the northern courtyard of the chateau. Dashwood's two th second, third guards were the last inside, only just closed the double gates before the French arrived. There was no time to secure the gates properly. Shots were fired through the woodwork, shattering the arm of Lieutenant and Captain Evelyn. Within moments, heavy axe blows combined with the pressure of a dozen bodies forced them open. The axe was wielded by Sous Lieutenant Legros of the 1st Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Light Regiment. Powerful man known as the Enforcer, formerly an engineer who had risen through the ranks, Legros burst into the compound at the head of his men. There was some desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A number of defenders fled into buildings, barns, and even some low pigsties before turning to shoot from windows or doors into the melee. Lieutenant Diedrich von Wilder, a Nassau officer in the Grenadier Company, was chased as far as the farmer's house. There he had the traumatic experience of having his hand chopped off at the wrist by a Frenchman with an axe. Whether it was Legros is not known. 
Wellington was within a whisker of losing Hougoumont. McDonald, near the gate leading to the garden, instantly realized that the gates must be closed at any cost to stop more Frenchmen pouring in. Yelling at three nearby officers, Captain and Lieutenant Colonel Windham, Ensigns Hervey and Gooch, all cold streamers, to join him, had dashed towards the gate near the well. Another six soldiers, Sergeants Fraser, McGregor, and Austin, plus Private Lester, all second and third guards, together with two more cold streamers. The Irish brothers, Corporals James and Joseph Graham, joined him. While some heaved on the gates, others fought with bayonets or swords to beat back more of the enemy as they arrived. Slowly, the gates were pushed together, barricaded, and the crossbar dropped into position. Frustrated by the closure, at least one Frenchman clambered onto the shoulders of a comrade and, leaning over the wall, took aim at Captain and Lieutenant Colonel Wyndham. Wyndham, who was holding Corporal James Graham's musket, calmly handed it back to Graham and took a quick shot at the Frenchman. Both fired simultaneously, but it was the Frenchman who dropped out of sight with a ball through his brain. With no reinforcements arriving, the 30 or so Frenchmen in the yard were doomed. Within five minutes, Legros and his comrades lay dead. The only one allowed to live was the young drummer boy who had somehow lost his drum. Hours later, at the end of the day, as the French fled the field, Wyndham is said to have spotted Prince Jerome in his carriage trying to escape. He allegedly leaped through one door as the Emperor's brother jumped from the other, thereby narrowly missing capturing him. The other interesting antidote is that after the closing of the gate incident, for the rest of his life, Wyndham could never bear sh to shut a door. As a result, he would often sit in a howling draft for hours on end, a habit that did not appear to undermine his health since he lived to be 70. <coughs> that is a detailed account of the closing of the North Gate what is the overall tactical significance of this farm? Well, Wellington's ridge south of Mont Saint-Jean was endowed with three natural outposts or strong points, of which Hougoumont was the largest. The others, of course, were La Laissant and the Papelette farm. They acted as three breakwaters jutting out from the flanks and center of his main position. Occupied, they would divide, channel, and weaken the force of frontal attacks just as breakwaters do with an advancing tide. Occupied by the enemy, they would seriously threaten the main position, providing ideal bases from which to launch strong assaults from not much above musket range. Ugamon required little work to make it a formidable place to assault. The large wood to the south screened most of the buildings from the French view. It also provided good cover for infantry who could move around quite freely since there was no undergrowth. Most importantly, the wood, and to a lesser extent, the Great Orchard, prevented the French from firing round shot or canister at the buildings or garden walls in preparation for an attack except from the west. The thick high hedges were a boon to the defenders and a curse to the attackers. They were just as effective a barrier as a man-made barricade. The significance of both sides of the hedge along the southern edge of the Great Orchard is demonstrated by Private Clay, who later described how he had to cut loopholes in it. The walls and buildings only required strong arms and pickaxes to provide loopholes. A number were knocked in the garden walls, but there would have been more had there been sufficient tools. Poking holes with bayonets in a brick wall is a frustratingly slow business. Although Lieutenant Graham, serving with the 2nd Light Battalion of the King's German Legion in Laissant, stated emphatically that they sent their pioneers across to Hougoumont on the evening of 17th of June to help prepare defenses. In order to bring sufficient muskets to bear on the wood, which if lost would provide a covered approach to within 20 meters of the wall, platforms had to be constructed on the inside to allow soldiers to fire over the top. This was a much more stressful undertaking than pushing a muzzle through a hole in the wall. These preparations were extended along the eastern wall facing the Great Orchard. The height of the wall, nearly 2 meters, was of considerable significance to the attackers, as there was no means of climbing over other than being pushed up by or clambering on the backs of one's comrades. Many gallant Frenchmen tried this. The few that succeeded merely fell dead inside rather than outside the garden. The only alternative for the French infantrymen was to bang away at the tiny loopholes or the heads of the defenders that kept bobbing up over the wall like so many snap targets on a modern firing range. The gap between the wall and the wood was a true killing zone. The northern boundary of the garden was not, as many maps indicate, a wall but a hedge. On this occasion, it was of no tactical importance, as the French never, except for a fleeting appearance at the north gate, got round to the rear of Hougoumont. 
Hugelmann presented the Duke with other advantages. Firstly, because it conferred so many advantages on those who occupied it, Hugelmann could be defended by comparatively few men. Secondly, unless captured, it would funnel any major attack on his right into the 950 meter gap between the eastern hedge of the orchard and Le Saint. To avoid effective enfilade musket fire from these strong points, the gap would be squeezed to around 650 meters. Thirdly, substantial supporting artillery fire could be brought down on attacking columns. Even those in the wood did not escape as within the hour of the first shot, Bull's troop of six howitzers was raining shrapnel through the trees with demoralizing effect. Bechelow's 5th Division never reached Hugelmont because their advance was driven back by the weight of artillery fire from the combined batteries on the ridge west of the Elm Tree Crossroads. All the tactical advantages that Hugelmont gave to its defenders were denied to its attackers. To the French, they became des deadly disadvantages. Napoleon never intended his capture, and th with this uh, I would add that I agree based on other sources. He never did fully intend to capture that. I think it well, his main intention was a, a kind of diversionary attack so he could focus more on the center, but Napoleon, uh, again, never intended its capture, although such a success would have secured the left flank of any subsequent assaults on the Duke's center right. To attack Hougoumont was an infantryman's job. The wood, the great orchard, and the buildings all required close quarter bullet and bayonet fighting to clear. Such combat is extremely costly, particularly without the support of guns. <clears throat> the French efforts to give direct support by t artillery to their infantry were so small as to be almost non-existent. The single howitzer was pushed forward, probably from the 3rd Company's 2nd Horse Artillery, to a position near the gate between the wood and the Great Orchard. Lord Sultan tried to capture it, but although it undoubtedly fired some canister, it seemed to have had little effect. The only artillery success instigated by the Emperor in person was when carcasses fired from howitzers set fire to most of the buildings. Now the gates, walls, or buildings would have withstood cannon fire. With a modicum of determination, a battery could have been pushed forward on the west or even the east of Hougoumont. Comparatively, few shots would have been sufficient to punch large holes in any of the defenses that were proof against musket balls. One wonders why it never happened. For Napoleon, it was far from essential to secure Hougoumont. It could, with difficulty, be ignored. It could be outflanked in the west or subject to a faint attack in the hope of drawing off some of Wellington's reserves. It was the latter role that Napoleon assigned to it without much success. Uh, let's pause briefly there before we move forward and examine some terrain features uh, indigenous to the uh, farm itself. So... You have, uh, as far as buildings proper, you have a north gate, which is initially left open and site of only French penetration of the compound. You've got these stabling and cow sheds, a well with a cover over the top, or I shouldn't say a cover, but a, a dove coat over the top. There's the great barn, which was burnt down between about 3 and 4 p.m. The archway with door linking the northern and southern courtyards. The chateau, which was unoccupied and unfurnished, also burnt down. The chapel miraculously escaped the fire, the flames only charring the wooden statue of Christ on the cross inside the wooden door. There's the farmer's house, occupied and in use at the time, but burnt down. Store sheds, a uh, small west door. There's the garden gate, used by defenders to move them in between the buildings and formal garden. There's the gardener's house and offices in use prior to the battle with the chapel, the only building to escape the fire, as mentioned. South gate, an arched passageway with doors at both ends, the store shed. And we have the, of uh, significant prominence, the kitchen garden. This was a narrow strip of land enclosed by a hedge. Uh, it's clearly described by Private Clay as a kitchen garden within which light companies and guards were deployed to meet the first French attack. Uh, the second main attack drove them inside the farm. There is the haystack. Yep, a single haystack. Beyond this haystack, Private Clay sought shelter while, uh, and his guards sought shelter while he fired at the enemy in the wood. He was so engrossed he failed to notice his comrades had withdrawn inside the farm via the north gate. 
It caught fire quite easily, and the battle nearby a mass grave was dug the next day for hundreds of corpses in the area. There's, of course, the wood. The wood was some 300 meters long, north to south, and 250 meters wide, defended by about 470 green-uniformed Hanoverians and Nassauers. It was soon captured by the French and remained in their hands for most of the day. It did screen the buildings from view and artillery fire from the south, but was no obstruction for infantry, and Lieutenant Captain Ellison later wrote, it had no underwood or undergrowth and was easily traversed in all parts by light infantry. The chateau or farm garrison, uh, the initial garrison inside the building was the Grenadier Coy of the 1st, 2nd Nassau, with the 2nd main French attack, the light companies of the 2nd and 2nd, 3rd withdrew inside the buildings. Subsequently, another seven companies of the second company reinforced the defenders of the buildings and formal gardens. There's the north gate. Uh, through this gate came reinforcements, uh, aide de camps, and the ammunition tumbrel. Some walking wounded also left by this gate. Area known as the killing ground. This is a 30 meter wide, 200 meter long strip of ground where most Frenchmen died, every attempt to cross it and scale the wall opposite failed. By the end of the battle, it was uh, almost impossible to walk along the northern edge of the wood without stepping on a body. The strip of land is shown on uh, Crane's, Crane's map as a vegetable garden. There's the garden walls. Seven foot high brick wall enclosed the southern and eastern sides of the formal garden. Vulnerable to artillery fire, was impervious to musket balls. It was these walls that enabled the defenders to repulse six times their number. Many loopholes had been knocked through both walls and platforms constructed to allow soldiers to fire over the top. A handful of Frenchmen fell dead into the garden, sunken way. This track with the thickest hedge on the south side formed a convenient rallying point for Allied troops when driven from the Great Orchard. The ground was low-lying and very marshy, the track formed the high water mark of French attacks in this area. Formal garden, an elaborately laid out ornamental garden with shrubs, flowers, and many small paths, defended initially by one company. Excuse me, of first second Nassau, subsequently reinforced by several companies of the Coldstream Guards. There is a gate which was intended to give access between the woods the wood fields and the orchard this gate had been blocked by defenders nevertheless it was a focal point for movement between the wood and the orchard and since standard stated the ditch at the corner of the wood by the gate was full of dead bodies and finally <clears throat> there's the great orchard this was in fact an apple orchard about 200 meters square defended initially by about 250 men from the 1st, 2nd Nassau Regiment, but for most of the battle by the light companies of these 2 slash 1 and 3 slash 1 guards under Lord Sultan was eventually relieved by most of the 2 slash 3 guards under Hepburn. This, or <coughs> excuse me, this orchard changed hands several times during the day. The high water mark of the French attacks was a northern hedge that borders the sunken way. The defenders on the eastern hedge were able to fire into the flanks of the French cavalry as they made their mass assaults in the late afternoon. And after the battle, all the apple trees had been shot to pieces and the orchard uh, generously recovered with red, green, and blue uniformed bodies. I should say generously covered. So there's a, a more detailed account of the significant terrain features um, peculiar to the Ugama farm. Let me pause briefly and all right, so well in considering Wellington's artillery fire, it says not all the Duke's artillery firing in support of Ugama fired into the wood like the howitzers. Many cannons refrained from doing so. Some, however, could not resist the tempting but long range up to about 1,500 meters and a high angle shoot at the infantry in the open waiting to advance. Foy's and Bachelot's divisions, Bachelot's chief of staff, Colonel Toisant Jean Trefcon, expressed surprise 
that his troops were hit even though they were unengaged and quite a respectable cannon shot away. Foy's aide-de-camp, Major Alamanier de la Fosse, not only recalled his division coming under fire, but also Kellerman's cavalry formed up behind him. The cannonballs had little velocity left, but were a nuisance. He states, behind us in reserve was the brigade of carabiners, on which the cannonballs which passed over us went to fall. To get out of their range, this brigade moved to their left, further behind Hougamont Wood, which provoked General Foy to laugh. Ha ha, the big boots don't like the rough stuff. We received the cannonballs standing firm. They covered us with mud and the soaked ground by conserving the marks of their paths. Looked like a field plowed by the wheels of carts. This was lucky for our line, for many of the projectiles buried or muffled themselves while rolling along this muddy soil. What of the forces engaged, you ask? There's a considerable uncertainty as to the precise numbers of troops committed to attacking and defending Hougoumont during the course of the battle. Figures at the start, which uh, is considered to be around 11.30 a.m., are reasonably clear for both sides, as are the reinforcements sent in during the next three hours or so. What happened after that until the end of the battle is far less certain. The uncertainties are twofold. Many sources claim that by the end of the day, the entire French Second Corps had been sucked into the struggle for Hougoumont, and that would consist of some 18,000 infantrymen. But this is difficult to justify. The figure hinges on whether Bacalao's division was drawn in. It is clear that at least his leading brigade attempted to advance on Hougoumont from the southeast around mid-afternoon. To reach the wood or Great Orchard, these battalions had to advance 1,000 meters diagonally across the Anglo-Allied front. As they neared their objective, they came under sustained and accurate shra uh, artillery fire, round shot, and shrapnel from Wellington's batteries along the ridge. The attack broke up without reaching Hougoumont. At the end of the day, Bachelot's division became involved in another operation against Wellington's center. For these reasons, this division has not been included in the number of French troops that actually assaulted Hougoumont. <coughs> Uh, the second difficulty involves the number of troops <coughs> Wellington sent to assist the garrison. During the afternoon, there is no doubt that as the whole Bing's 2nd Brigade got drawn forward into Hougoumont, the Duke moved up reserves from the rear to strengthen and support his front line. Several sources indicate that Brunswick, Hanoverian, and Nassau units moved in the direction of Hougoumont. This is correct, but there is no evidence that any of these troops were actually engaged defending the place. Being musket-armed soldiers, they needed to come down the forward slope into the compound, orchard, or wood to be of any use. They did not do so until the battle was virtually over, possibly between 7 and 7.30 p.m. or later. The 2nd King's German Legion, Colin Halkett's Hanoverians, the Brunswick Advance Guard, and the Lieb and 1st Light Battalions advanced into and drove the French out of the orchard and most of the wood. Because this happened so late in the battle, and none of these units were involved in the actual defense of the position, they've not been included in the defender's strength. In light of the above, the comparison of relative strengths, reinforcements, and very approximate timings are given below. These consist of from 1130 to 1230, about 4,000 French or 7 battalions, and about 1,200 equivalent to roughly 2 battalions for the Anglo-Allied. And then from 12.30 to 1.30, you're looking at 3,500 uh, French, or 6 battalions, and 2,500 French, or 5 battalions, to 9 companies, or roughly 1 battalion of Anglo-Allied. And finally, from 1.30 to 2.30, about 2,700 French, or 6 battalions, to 6 companies, uh, says, but 2 withdrawn for the Anglo-Allied, for a total of... 12,700, or roughly 24 battalions for the French, versus 2,600 plus for the Anglo-Allied, uh, equivalent to about 4.5 battalions. In terms of infantrymen actual fighting for possession of Hougoumont by earlier afternoon, the French outnumbered the Anglo-Allied forces 5 to 1. Put another way, Ryle had committed over 23% of his Emperor's infantry in comparison to Wellington's 5%. With artillery, it is impossible to be certain as to the number of guns or batteries actually supporting the defense of or attacks on Hougoumont. The French probably employed five batteries or 34 pieces initially. However, once the infantry took the wood, the great majority of firing in support of the 2nd Corps took the form of counter-battery fire. 
The Duke brought up eight or nine batteries, including both six howitzers, into action within the first hour. There's no doubt that others joined in later when they did not have more pressing targets to engage, and ammunition stocks allowed, or that it was artillery fire that inflicted at least as many losses as musket balls on the attackers. The combination of howitzers and spherical case, or shrapnel, proved ideal against an enemy concealed from view in the wood, and it was gunfire that prevented Bachelot's division from effectively joining the struggle. Well, we will backtrack one second for the couple more side notes here. It says, French failed to use their guns effectively. Writing in 1836 in the United Service Journal under the name W, a British officer who fought at Hougoumont, emphasized how fortunate the defenders were. The French failed to use their guns against the western flank of the chateau and farm, which was unprotected by the wood. It's probable, excuse me, it's probable that this error cost them success at Hougoumont. And I myself have often wondered why artillery wasn't simply used against Hougoumont rather than having infantry try and flood in there. He states on the French side of the house and garden, coming down close to both, was an open but thickly planted wood of about five acres. Upon this wood did the successful issue of the defense and real strength of the post entirely depend. For the house and garden, although proof against musketry, could not have stood for ten minutes against the fire of a few pieces of field artillery, but, ill-built, must have tumbled down and buried its defenders in the ruins. Neither could the orchard have been kept for one moment after the fall and occupation of the house and garden, <clears throat> but the wood entirely screened the house, garden, and offices from the site and operation of the enemy's artillery, rendering mud-cemented, which is actually incorrect, walls through which their shots would have passed like brown paper, thus equal for the purposes of the defense to the strongest fortification. Owing to the existence of this wood, the troops occupying the house and garden enjoyed a complete exemption from the storm of shot and shell which fell with such fury on the other parts of the main position, except an ill-directed shell which occasionally passed over and now and then a discharge of grape or canister which was lost among the branches of the trees. The attack and defense consisted entirely of musketry. <clears throat> Another account, uh, consisting of names I can't pronounce. Colonel Cubier, Cubier meets Sergeant Fraser. Marechal de Camp Baudouin, Baudouin commanded the 1st Brigade of Jerome's division and had the dubious honor of leading the first attack on Hougoumont Wood. Like the other French senior officers, he led the way into the wood conspicuously mounted on a horse. One of the augers, or Hanoverian sharpshooters, easily picked him out. Within minutes, he'd been shot dead. Command of the brigade devolved into the commanding officer of the 1st Light, Colonel Cubier. After about an hour, the 1st Brigade cleared the wood in Great Orchard, but was held up by the walls around Hougoumont. Jerome sent in his 2nd Brigade under Sola. His arrival allowed Cubier to lead the fight against McDonald to the west of the buildings. The weight of numbers slowly drove the guards back out of the kitchen guard, garden, and along the path outside the west wall towards the north gate. It was on this path that Cubiere came up against 33-year-old Sergeant Ralph Fraser of the 2-3 guards. Fraser was very much the tough, old-sweat veteran NCO who had served and fought in Egypt and over Copenhagen and the Peninsular War. He'd twice been seriously wounded. The colonel took a swing at the sergeant with his sword, with Fraser avoided, and lunged upwards with his halberd. As light company sergeants did not normally carry halberds, there is some doubt as to what weapon he used. Cubiere was wounded and knocked or pulled from his horse. Instead of killing him, Fraser leapt on the colonel's horse and rode back to the north gate, through which most of his comrades were withdrawing. The wounded Cubiere survived and later became a general, a baron and governor of Ancona in Italy. He forever remained grateful to Fraser and other guards who spared him. By a strange turn of fate, Colonel Woodford who later became a field marshal, met Cubieri in 1832, inevitably talk turned to Waterloo. Woodford later wrote, He says we forbore to fire upon him, and he owes us much for many good years since. I have some recollection of the circumstance, of which he always makes a great deal. Fraser, who minutes later helped to close the North Gate, received a special medal for his gallantry, but, surprisingly, was discharged three years later in consequence of long service and being worn out was only 38. The medical authorities had made a very poor diagnosis. Fraser was good for another 47 years. He became a 
a bedsman at Westminster Abbey, dying at the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1862, aged 85. <clears throat> What else do we have here? No shortage of stuff. Try and run through the pertinent material. Skimming a few things here. What are the uh, what are the plans and intentions and orders? Well, Wellington's plan was to hold Hougoumont. When he visited the chateau for the second time that morning, his orders to Captain and Lieutenant Colonel McDonald were equally simple. Defend the post to the last extremity. The French intentions with regard to Hougoumont were much less clear. Napoleon's attack order timed at around 11 a.m. makes his original intention for the army quite plain. It is straightforward, short, and with the overall objective clearly set out. This order was dictated by the emperor, written by Soult, and addressed to all corps commanders to understand the French activities at Hougoumont. It needs to be stated in full. And it states, directly, the army has formed up, and soon after 1 p.m., the emperor will give the order to Marshal Ney, and the attack will be delivered on Mont Saint-Jean village in order to seize the crossroads at that place. To this end, the 12-pound batteries of 2nd and 6th Corps will mass with that of the 1st Corps. These 24 guns will bombard the troops holding Mont Saint-Jean, and Count d'Erlon will commence the attack by first launching the left division and, when necessary, supporting it, with other divisions of 1st Corps. 2nd Corps, commanded by Riley, was also advanced, will also advance, keeping abreast of the 1st Corps. The company of the engineers belonging to 1st Corps will hold themselves in readiness to barricade and fortify Mont Saint-Jean. Directly, it is taken. Added in pencil to a copy of the order in Ney's handwriting was the note, Count de Erlon will note that the attack will be delivered first by the left instead of commencing from the right. Informed General Riley of this change. This order and Ney's addition have considerable bearing on the French actions at Hougoumont. Napoleon's orders for the army attack at 1 p.m. make no mention of Hougoumont. Both leading corps under Ney were to make frontal advances, keeping abreast of each other after preliminary artillery bombardment. The objective was Mont Saint-Jean village. Darlan was to start the attack with his left division. If this order had been followed, Hougoumont would have come under attack after 1 p.m. as part of the general advance of the two leading corps. As we know, this is not what happened. As Ney wrote in his hurried note, there was a change to the original order shortly after it was issued. Almost certainly, it was related to Hougoumont. In the Emperor's first order, Raoul would have read that the attack would begin with the right-hand corps, commanded by Darlan, leading with his left division. This has been altered to the battle, starting with the left corps, commanded by Raoul. There's no surviving written record of these changed orders, which were possibly verbal. Without new orders, there's no way that Rod would have dared to open the battle instead of Darlon, and to do so one and a half hours early. Soon after issuing his original order, Napoleon changed his mind. The overall objective remained the same, but the method of achieving it had been altered. Firstly, he increased the weight of the preparatory bombardment by adding three batteries of guard artillery to the Grand Battery. Secondly, he decided to launch a preliminary limited attack on Hougoumont to hopefully draw in some of Wellington's reserves before Derlon made the main assault. Napoleon had intended to get bogged down. Napoleon never intended to get bogged down in Hougoumont. He had no wish to see 23% of his infantry dragged into a costly struggle for an objective that was almost irrelevant to the overall plan. There was no need to capture Hougoumont, and Napoleon's second orders reflect that. Riley, in passing on his orders to Prince Jerome, merely told him to occupy the low ground south of the wood, maintaining in front a strong line of skirmishers. That 24 battalions ultimately became embroiled was partially the fault of Jerome in committing his entire division in desperate attempts to take the chateau and garden with, when this was not his orders. More at fault, however, was his corps commander for not stopping him and then making the situation worse by sending in Foy's division. He even tried to reinforce failure by uh, ordering Bachelot forward. It was perhaps ironic that Anglo Allied gunfire prevented this folly. Then we have. Gallantry at Hougoumont rewarded, which states later in the afternoon, when the buildings caught fire, Corporal James Graham rescued his wounded brother from a blazing barn. After the battle, he received immediate promotion to sergeant. 
He and Sergeant Frazier of the 2-3 Guards received a special medal for their gallantry. The Reverend John Knockross, rector of Farm Framlingham, gave an annuity of 10 pounds a year to one of his brave countrymen who fought in the late tremendous but glorious conflict. Wellington nominated Graham to receive it. However, the rector went bankrupt after two years. But when he died and left 500 pounds to be given to the bravest man in England, Wellington chose McDonald, but his colonel gave half to Graham, who lived on until 1843. <clears throat> Next, we can look at what they call special features, consisting initially of command and control. <clears throat> Wellington, uh, Wellington took considerable interest in what happened at Ugamal. He visited the place twice before the battle and probably selected the commander, McDonnell. Uh, he decided on the garrison being reinforced by the 1-2 Nassau. He issued orders for its defense personally to McDonnell, and he watched events closely the for, for the first hour and a half from the ridge beyond the chateau. It is likely that he gave the instructions to Bing regarding the enforcement of the garrison during that time. When Bull arrived with his howitzers, Wellington briefed him as to the delicate indirect fire task he wanted carried out. He later sent Major Hamilton, aide-de-camp to the adjutant general, to the chateau with orders to, quote, hold the position to the very last and on no account to give it up or abandon it, end quote. During the afternoon, when his attentions were elsewhere, he still found time to send explicit written instructions on what to do about the burning buildings. Instructions that would have seemed more appropriate coming from a sergeant rather than the commander-in-chief. At Ugamont, the command setup was confusing. This was due to several factors. The first was that reinforcements came piecemeal with senior officers arriving without the knowledge of the whereabouts of those already there, or whether their seniority placed them in command. Because of the extraordinary double rank system in the guards, at about 2.30 p.m., there were two colonels, uh, Woodford and Hepburn, whose seniority was exactly the same to the day, and nine, possibly ten lieutenant colonels, all inside the buildings and garden. When Woodford arrived, he declined to assume command from McDonald, but McDonald could not physically command what was happening in the Great Orchard. So the fighting in that area was led by Lord Sultan until he withdrew on the arrival of Colonel Hepburn and the final reinforcements from the 2-3 guards. Mark a page that I may come back to. At that stage, things became, became even more muddled. Because Bing had assumed command of the division when Sir George Cook was severely wounded, Hepburn was now the acting brigade commander. Despite this, he did not take overall command at Ugamont. Indeed, Wellington gave much of the credit for the remaining hours of the defense of the position in his dispatch to Captain and Lieutenant Colonel, home of the 2-3 guards. It was even junior to McDonnell. The, this bewildering situation partly arose when Major Hamilton arrived with orders from McDonnell to find only home in the courtyard. Hamilton understandably asked, do you command here? To which Holm responded, I believe so. I have seen no officer superior to myself. It has been reported to me that Colonels McDonald and Woodford are not to be found. They were, in fact, in the garden. Fortunately, this bizarre state of affairs did not affect the conduct of the defense. Throughout the battle, Captain Buskin, the acting commander of the 1st 2nd Nassau, whose troops made up a sizable proportion of the garrison, was unaware of who his commander was. In his written account, he stated, Neither when I was first detached nor during this period of the attacks on Ugamal was any commander under whose orders I was placed named to me. I saw no other troops other than the Coldstream Guards sent to support the battalion under my command. I do not know if and what other troops were later sent to support this position. Due to the continuous fighting and the view restricted by trees, hedges, and walls, I could not observe what was happening at a distance. <clears throat> The French did not have quite the same sort of difficulties. While, as corps commander, failed to ensure the emperor's younger brother carried out his orders, perhaps because he was such a close relative, Prince Jerome, despite his relationship to Napoleon, was only the commander of a division, albeit the largest one in the army. He allowed his eagerness for glory to cancel out any modicum of tactical ability he may have possessed. Despite the pleas of his chief of staff, Golimino, Ryle did nothing to stop Jerome, and himself abandoned the lessons of his considerable experience, ignored his orders, and flung in Foy's division. Napoleon's attention was soon distracted by far more crucial events in the East, but
but he did insist on pushing forward the two horse artillery batteries belonging to Kellerman in order to bolster the, op the opening bombardment of Ugamont. <clears throat> Later, he found time to order howitzers to fire incendiary carcasses into the chateau complex with good effect. <clears throat> wow, that sounds like fun. Incendiary carcasses. Had he been able to devote more time to his left, no doubt the artillerymen and him would have ensured that guns were brought to bear on the buildings. This was the other major failing of the French command at Ugamont. Finally, it talks about <clears throat> ammunition and casualties. Uh, there was a lot of ammunition expended at Hougamont. Not surprisingly, the troops in the buildings and garden ran short during the afternoon. It was only the timely arrival of the gallant private brewer of the royal wagon train with his cart that prevented a critical situation becoming a disastrous one. The maximum number of soldiers defending the buildings, garden, and the great orchard at any one time was around 2,600. Each man would have started out with some 50 balls on his person because of the intensity of the fighting, the need for virtually every man to be in the firing line, coupled with the length of time, the action continued with varying intensity up to nine hours. There's little doubt that the average soldier had to replenish his ammunition during the afternoon. From this, it is not too fanciful to assume the average musket-armed guardsman or rifle-armed Jager fired at least 50 times during the battle within a battle. Some would have fired many more, others less. That re represents roughly 130,000 shots. How much damage did the musket balls do? Again, we come up against the difficulty in assessing French casualties. Most sources state as a bald fact that 5,000 Frenchmen fell dead or wounded at Hougoumont but without justifying this number. This figure is a sixth of the entire army's losses, 30,000, or 39% of those actually attacking Hougamal. Probably a quarter were hit by artillery fire, with the rest, uh, about 3,750, the victims of musketry, 30 to 35 shots to secure a hit. Assuming that some 12,700 Frenchmen from Drome's and Foy's divisions were fully engaged for some of the time in Hougoumont and that they each carried about 35 rounds, it's safe to say that there was no need for many of these men to start scrabbling around for extra ammunition. There would have been between four, 400,000 and 450,000 rounds with the attacking troops. The deployed skirmishers would have kept up a steady fire over prolonged periods, but of those 24 battalions committed, now more than five or six would have been actually firing at any one time. There just wasn't enough room. Not all battalions were evolved from the beginning. There were lulls, and even when attacking the buildings or garden, firing by individuals would be slow. Furthermore, <clears throat> as happens in all battles, a portion of soldiers would hardly have fired at all. This was due to the crush, confusion, smoke, and lack of worthwhile targets, most of the enemy being behind a wall or in a building, <clears throat> and the inevitable hanging back by some. On average, French soldier attacking Ugamont would have been doing well to fire more than 15 times. This gives an ammunition expenditure of over 190,000 shots. Put another way, on average, about 350 French muskets were firing every minute through the nine hours. How effective was it? The quick answer is not very. The answer is easier to give than that concerning <clears throat> the defender's musketry. Apart from a tiny handful, musket balls caused almost every casualty inflicted on the defenders. In one important way, the troops in Hougoumont had it easier than the rest of the Duke's army on the ridge. They were subjected to very little effective artillery fire. Also, the casualty returns for the guards at Waterloo are known. The figures below indicate the estimated casualties inflicted while the units were at Hougoumont. <coughs> Second Coldstream Guards, 308 or 29 percent. Second slash third guards, <coughs> excuse me, 239 or 23 percent. Light Company 2nd slash 1st Guards, 30. This company was drawn to the ridge before 3 p.m., so about 23%. Light Company 3rd slash 1st Guards, 30. Withdrawn is above 25%. 1st slash 2nd Nassau, 200. Estimate based on 25% uh, casualties. Total casualties for the three battalions of the 2nd Nassau Regiment were, says, 472. Hanoverians and Jagers, says, 40. The estimate is based on 25% casualties. For a total of 847, almost 33% of the troops engaged. These figures suggest that it took <clears throat> 224 French musket shots to secure a hit, which is amazing. That's just crazy. 
This is not such a poor performance as it seems. Most defenders were behind cover of some sort for much of the time, if only a hedge or a tree. The majority were behind brick walls. When a Frenchman fired a defender, he was either trying to hit the head and shoulders of a man who kept bobbing up from behind a wall, or he was shooting at a tiny loophole <clears throat> only a few inches across. <clears throat> Add to this the fear, the noise, the confusion, the smoke, the inaccuracy of his weapon, and the fires need to be quick. He is far more vulnerable than his target 30 meters away. It is little wonder his shots invariably missed. 224, now this is me speaking again, 224 shots to secure one hit. If we break that down into game terms and dice rolling, if you roll 2 die 10 and consider 0 to 100, You'd have to get a 1 or a 2 to get a hit. What is that, a 2% chance every time you roll to fire? Anyway, I did skip a few things along the way. Let's see if those are worth returning to. <clears throat> Probably so. Uh, looks like there is an account of the British Guard companies defending Hugoman. It lists names, companies, etc. I won't read that. There's an account of Lord Sultan himself. It says Alexander George Fraser was the 16th Baron Sultan who won undying fame at the age of 30, commanding the two light companies of the first foot guards in the Great Orchard at Ukamont. He was originally commissioned into the 42nd Foot, but purchased a first purchased a first foot guards vacancy at enormous cost to his father in 1804 when he was 19. In 1815, he was captain and lieutenant colonel, but only ninth in seniority among those of his rank in the regiment. He was actually the company commander of the light company of the three, third slash first foot guards and saw action with it again during the pulse of the Imperial Guard in the late evening. He had four horses shot under him uh, during the day but remained unscathed. His leadership during the battle became something of a legend. Wellington was supposed to have described him as, quote, a pattern to the army both as a man and soldier, end quote. He survived Waterloo untouched, but several days later, when involved in the attack on Perron Le Purcell, a musket ball struck him on his breeches pocket. Fortunately, the force of the blow was taken by some five franc coins. <clears throat> Salt was badly bruised. He went on to command a brigade in the first opium war against China in 1842, before eventually rising to lieutenant general and colonel in chief of the Coldstream Guards. Uh, Says Archibald Forbes, a war correspondent who died in 1900, told of a visit he made as a boy with his father to a house in Scotland at the mouth of Glen Roths. While waiting outside the house, he was greeted by, quote, a very queer-looking old person, short of figure, round as a ball. His head shrunk between very high and rounded shoulders and with short, stumpy legs. He was curiously attired in a whole-colored suit of gray, droll-shaped jacket, the great color of which reached far up the back of his head surmounted by a pair of volum voluminous breeches with suddenly tightened at the knee. And it says the young Forbes mistook him for the butler. It was, of course, the Lord Sultan of Waterloo fame, looking somewhat decrepit for a man in his early 60s. He died in uh, 1853 at 68. Mm. <clears throat> Consider running through timelines but before while I consider that I will read looks like there's two more accounts let's do the arrival of the first slash second Nassau it says seldom if ever does an account of the struggle for Hougamont mention the fact that for almost an hour during the first and most powerful French attack that resulted in the loss of the wood and part of the great orchard there was almost certainly not a single British guardsman in the buildings formal garden great orchard or wood all these locations were defended by the first slash second Nassau under Captain Bushkin assisted by some 200 Hanoverians. The only British guardsmen present were the light companies of the 2nd Coldstream Guards and the 2nd slash 3rd Guards under McDonald, both deployed west of the Chateau in the Kitchen Garden area. Only about 160 to 170 men, as both battalions had suffered losses at Quetre Bras. The light companies of the 2nd slash 1st and 3rd slash 1st Guards under Lord Sultan had been withdrawn at the arrival of the 1st slash 2nd Nassau. In other words, as the Nassauers moved into Hougamont, the guards pulled out, have to rejoin their battalions on the ridge, where Sultan was, and have to a position west of the buildings, where McDonald was. 
Having toiled all night in the rain, preparing the place for defense, and then being ordered to hand it over to the Nassauers must have provoked more than a few unprintable comments from the guardsmen. <coughs> Captain and Lieutenant Colonel Daniel McKinnon, who led the Grenadier Company of the 2nd Coldstream Guards at Ugamal and later wrote their official history, has made this little-known event abundantly clear. Quote, At 10 o'clock, the light companies of the guards, i.e. all four companies, were relieved by a battalion of 800 Nassau light troops. Part of this corps was stationed in the lofts, buildings, yards, and out offices. The remainder within the Hanoverian Jagers would arrive the previous night, were distributed in the orchard and wood. Lord Sultan then joined the 2nd Brigade on the main position. Lieutenant Colonel McDonald with his companies moved to the right west of the chateau. Staff officer had guided the 1st, 2nd Nassau to Ugama at around 1 at 10 a.m. on 18th of June. He gave the order to Lord Sultan to hand over his responsibilities for the defense of the Great Orchard and rejoin his battalion. Sultan had conducted com Captain Buskin around the orchard area before marching back up the ridge. On his way, he met the Duke riding down for his companies. Being told where they were going, he seemed not to have authorized their withdrawal. He instructed Sultan to remain where he was until further orders. Shortly after the battle started, an aide-de-camp rode up, told Sultan to continue back to his brigade. Almost the moment he arrived, he was hurriedly sent back, as the Nassauers were losing the Great Orchard. <clears throat> Captain Buskin, who was commanding the battalion as Ma Major Sattler had taken over command of the regiment, had this to say of the situation on his arrival. Quote, the, fir the farm and the garden were unoccupied. A company of Brunswick Jagers stood at the furthest edge of the wood and immediately undertook the necessary deployment for the defense. Had the Grenadier Company occupy the buildings and sent two companies to the vegetable garden, or the formal garden next to them. I placed one company behind the hedge of the orchard, moved the Voltigeurs into line with the Brunswick Jager, south, uh, southern edge of the wood, and placed one company in reserve a little to the rear of the Jagers. Buskin goes on to add that after the first French attack had been thrown back, the Jager company, quote, rejoined its corps in the main position, end quote. Now, Ugamont after the battle, uh, a visitor on the day after the battle described the great orchard thus, quote, I came first upon the orchard and there discovered heaps of dead men in various uniforms, those of the guards in their usual red jackets, the German legion, consisting of the second King's German legion had attacked through there in the evening, and the French dressed in blue mingled together. The dead and the wounded positively covered the whole area of the orchard, not less than 2,000 men had fallen there. The apple trees presented a singular appearance. Shattered branches were seen hanging about their mother trunks in such profusion that one might suppose the stiff-growing and stunted tree had been converted into a willow. Every tree was riddled and smashed. In the wood, the scene was similar. Every tree in the wood is pierced with balls, and one alone I counted the holes where upwards of thirty had lodged. Huge piles of human ashes, dreadfully offensive in smell, are now all that remain of the heroes. The poor countryman who, with his wife and family, occupied the gardener's house, still inhabit a miserable shed among the deserted ruins. The buildings of Ugama were infinitely more shattered, or rather burnt, than those of Les Saint. In one spot, 50 dead bodies lay close together. Near this was a black scorched place where 600 human, cor 600 human corpses found in the grounds were collected and burned. This mass burial pit was near where the haystack used to be near the south gate. So, having read all of that, the only other thing, uh, accounts that remain, <clears throat> consist of, again, maps with uh, details stating who was stationed where, uh, brief timelines. But the meat of the matter has already been spoken. Hmm. So, I will leave you to it. Not sure yet if I will uh, go over any visual aid. Uh, the at uh, the most, I will bring out the um, 15 mm millimeter Ugama farm from Warlord and maybe point out significant features of that. At the least, I will go over what I have set up uh, scenario-wise for this uh, Commands and Colors Ugama scenario found in the uh, Generals, Marshals, and Tacticians expansion set and point out key features there. That said, thank you guys for listening. I hope that was enjoyable. If you have things to add that uh, contradict what was stated, 
please feel free to, to bring them forth as what this is about. Uh, engagement, dialogue, conversation. Let us know. <clears throat> um, questions, etc. I'll do my best to answer. I'll see you in the next installment.